thinking about that with regards to the, I just told you about like concentration camps and the gulags. Mm. Do you think that the people who were, like one of the first questions I remember asking you guys in the school year, it was during the first week, I don't know if you guys can remember that far back, but I asked you that question, how many of you think that if you were living in Germany back in the 1930s, you would have been a concentration camp guard? How many of you think that you could have been one of those, per, one of those people who committed those, those atrocities? And a lot of us, our, our gut reaction is, no way I can have done that. There's no way I would have done that. I don't know, though. A lot of people did. And I would suggest to you that if that's a really fast answer from you, that you might not know yourself very well. Maybe. Because these are people who, because a lot of people chose to do those things. And because they were pressured to, we might say they were forced to, whatever word we want to use. And I guess that would be the question. Could you see yourself being pressured or forced to do these things? And I think that the past two years have taught us a lot. I think we've got a really good look at ourselves if we pay attention to it. And I think that that's something that we really have um, learned, is that many of us, even today, still could do those things. Because what's changed, except for the year? Human nature is still human nature. And we're still capable of those things. Having those kinds of evil thoughts, like you're saying about, oh, killing children or not, oh, but that's not me. Not it is you. The question is which side of these of you is going to win. Is it the good side that's going to suppress the evil, or is it the evil side that's going to suppress the good? You know, that's that internal fight that we're talking about. Yeah. Hello there. What's the value of having the evil inside of yourself, or at least admitting it? Oh, mm, the good thing about having evil thoughts is like, is at least like I said, honesty, and you're not lying to yourself a lot about what your real intentions is, or, or for that, you can even say that to, like, um, like, for parents, when they lie to your kids about, like, fictional things that are real, but they're not real, like, heck, uh, some ki some parents I've seen, like, for example, like, we talked about before, like, some ki parents really, like, mer lied about the kids about, oh, Santa's real, and then later on in the future, they tell them, oh, it's not real, and you just... Oh man, fuck, he's not, he's not, he's not real? I'm oh, sorry. Man, what a shit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Destroys our hope. Yeah. Basically, yeah. It's, 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 but they do it, but they did it, they did something evil, but in good intention. That's a thing. So there's, yeah. so what's the real evil part of that story? Tell them that he's real or tell them that he's fake? That's <laughs> You keep to make the kids happy. What's, what's the evil part? Is the evil part telling your kids that Santa is real, or is it evil to tell your kids that Santa doesn't exist? Santa doesn't exist. Santa doesn't exist. Why is that evil? So I get over so that after that, you know, they're like, you Santa. So that's not the evil part. The yeah. evil part is lying to them. Being yeah, lying to them. Yeah. It could, yeah. To challenge the thought of telling them that he, is, that he isn't real, being evil. Yeah. Uh, there's not a difference between like giving them like a fantasy and then believing that oh that's that's the real world, but something else lying underneath. Like sure, this context is better. Oh, it's Santa Claus, but no, it's me spending money in Walmart. Mm. What's it called? But <laughs> it could also be put as something else, as like the, the something like amazing, something good, and then but underneath it there's something bad. And what would be the cruel thing? Telling them, hey, this is the reality. You're fucked. Or, or hey, look at this. Live a lie. Hmm. <clears throat> definitely have some things to say about that. Yeah. I remember a lot, so. Fuck. Okay, I think a lot. Yeah. Good. Wait. Good. It's kind of a sad thought. <laughs> Good. My, those are my favorite kind. That's the only kind that are real. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's kind of a sad thought that once you start to understand the complexity of the fuck. The complexity and nuance and the way that the world works. That your joy dramatically goes down from day to day. And it also makes me uh, it also makes me mad that I hear people that are older than me, people that are younger than me, people in my same generation say, I wish the world could go back to when things were simpler. But you don't want that. You really don't. What you want is when you didn't know how to work. As if understanding the machine, <laughs> as if understanding the machine scares you. 
Knowing how much pain is caused just by existing. How much pain do you think is inside a burger? Like, like, a, like a cheeseburger. You get it from McDonald's. How many what? How many, <laughs> in, how many The what? cow and the underpoint <laughs> workers have much pain. Yeah, really, because how much, I mean, how much pain <laughs> I'm going to get into. How much suffering goes into the production of the cheeseburger that's on your plate? Uh, and I'm, I'm talking specifically like a fast food burger. Oh. <laughs> that's the question. Yeah, is it like, real? Am I being lied to? The cow that died. Actually, McDonald's, by the way, McDonald's cheeseburgers are the highest quality beef you can buy. There's no fucking way. It's a true story. Look it up. McDonald's buys from the highest quality beef producers that you can buy. Dang, this is a fact. We're going to do fact check here. No, the, what, what most people complain about is that most of it is frozen. So if you don't like the frozen beef, have the quarter pounder with cheese. That's their, that's their one. That's one cheeseburger from my note that's fresh, it's not frozen. That makes sense. And that's why you guys like In N Out so much. Because In N Out is fresh, never frozen, like the commercials say. That's the distinction. So I really like the way I've got him back for you. Go ahead. Go on. Knowing how much pain is caused just by existing. How much pain is inside a burger that you get at a fast food a fast food place? You get a baby male uh, milking cow. You only need one steer to make babies. They castrate them, castrate them immediately with a rubber band. They're crammed into boxes, fed for about three months, oh, then butchered, returned it to me. Oh, yeah. And then you get this. I'm still trying to get my burger. Technically, this leads to vegetarian. That joy. Is this going to be for you? Sounds like a burger. No, it's not. I eat it all the time, bro. I think. I mean, you think, actually, I, I think that his, his point is making itself, but go ahead. I like, I like this analogy. I like this analogy. Right? If you put that whole scheme and gave it the consciousness of a person, it wouldn't think I am a commodity made to be mass produced. I am something that's born to be eaten. I am something that's not meant to live. Like a purpose? You would think that the machine is made to torture you bring the most pain out of you just because that's what the machine wants. Nobody's evil. You can put anything into any situation and make it evil. I just explained to you how you get burgers. I fucking love burgers. I will eat two every time I go to Italy. Right, you make it love it too, bro. I love it too, bro. I like that. You gotta go plant based meat. If you go vegan, you're still not creating less pain on the earth. You would literally have to become a caveman. Somebody Live me. off elk livers and tree bark and fucking pine needles. <laughs> Edible bark, I forgot about that. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I said all this flowery, like, pedantic shit to tell you, are you evil? Is everything that you consume, everything that you do, does that make you an evil person to enjoy those things? You would literally kill the person that you are now by changing the way that you live. That doesn't make you evil. You're just living. A smart man told me, living is pain. And how much pain you bring in the world is up to you. It's a wise man. Damn. It's a wise man with keen fashion sets and great boots. <laughs> Dude, that, that is some deep analogy, bro. I'm glad we recorded this. I'm glad we recorded this. Fuck, that was good. But the point, well, here's the thing. The point is actually, like I was saying, the point makes itself. First off, masterfully delivered. You notice that he gave you time to, to chat among yourselves and to make comments, and some of you were like, uh, well, I'm trying to enjoy my burger. I'm trying to... That kind of exactly proves the point he was making. That when we... That, you know, I don't want to know about it. If I know about it, well, shoot, now I have to do something about it. And this is why... <laughs> no, but here's the thing. You are, though. You are, though. You're doing nothing. Remember the, the, the trolley car case? I think we talked about it in this class, right? I think no. Either pull the lever or you don't. Mm, no. 
Which one are we talking about? We haven't talked about that? No, 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 no. too bad. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like they can't do it. It's like if you know, okay, good example. Um, Forever 21. Any of you shop at Forever 21? No. no. Forever 21 was busted a number of years ago because they were employing sweatshop labor in South America. Um, specifically, they had children making their clothing in sweatshops, little children. Now, if you know about that, and you know the little kids are making the clothing, and you know that that's why you're paying so little for it, if you sit there and you buy, I'm sorry, if you buy it, then you're, then you're supporting slave labor, essentially. And so now, you might say, like, well, I'm just buying it. But yeah, but you know that that's, why, that's where it's coming from. And so by buying it now, you're supporting it. Because now you know. Now, maybe before that, you could have said, well, I didn't know where it was coming from. And that's true. Ignorance, is, ignorance does matter. Like we say, like, ignorance is no excuse to the law. But it is. It really is. If you don't know any better. If you don't know the suffering that goes into a cheeseburger, it would make completely make sense to eat it. That's why kids will sit there and dance while they eat their McDonald's. Because they're not sitting there going, like, tasty, tasty murder. They're, they're thinking, they, in fact, they probably don't even necessarily make the connection that's coming from a cow. But if you see the whole process from gain to end, and you're aware of it, well, your awareness is exactly what creates responsibility. I'll say that again. Your awareness is exactly what creates responsibility. Once you know that something is the way that it is, you're, you're, you're responsible for how you act in it. Now, again, you can just not change anything, and that's fine. But understand that that's what you're contributing to. So we talked about we want to, that's a, it's a good point that we want to go back to simpler times. No, we don't. We want to go back to when we didn't know any better. It's one of the reasons that some people will, will <clears throat> I'm sure we talked about it in this class. What happens if you try and change the world? <laughs> the world gets shot. You get shot. Remember this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you try to change the world, you get shot. Lincoln tried to change the world, he got shot. JFK tried to change the world, he got shot. Gandhi tried to change the world, he got shot. Yeah. Jesus tried to change the world, he got crucified. He got the same. But he got but basically got shot with some nails. <laughs> you, you try to change the world, you're gonna get shot. Why? Because what is it that all these folks have in common? Well they all bring something to us, they all bring some truth to us that we would rather have not known about. This is what happens to Socrates. Socrates is charged with two crimes, as we're going to see next quarter. Okay. He was charged with, one, introducing foreign gods to Athens. The god that he introduced was called his daemon, which essentially is what we would call our conscience. He, he said that there was a voice in his head that warned him not to do things, told him, stop saying this, you're going too far. He didn't tell him what to do, it told him what not to do, so we would call that our conscience. The second crime he was charged with was corrupting the youth. And, the, and what, the, specifically, he corrupted the youth because he went around and he asked people questions. He would go to like a, uh, a priest and say, oh, so you're, you're an expert in the gods. Yes, okay, perfect. And Socrates said, I don't know anything. So, I would, so he would go around and ask people questions. He'd go to experts and he would go to a priest and ask him, so what is, it that the, well, what is it that's good and evil? Well, evil is what the gods hate and good is what the gods love. Okay, now I understand. Wait a second, though. Aren't our stories full, though, of the gods being at war with each other? Yes. So some gods love certain things, and other gods think other things are evil. Yeah, same stuff. Right. So how can that be? If the gods disagree about what's good and evil, which gods do we listen to? And by asking questions, young people would see that and go, Oh my goodness, the priests have no idea what they're talking about. And once you revealed that they knew nothing about what they were talking about, that was considered corrupting the youth. You will find out what people know and what they don't know. Two ways. First and foremost, listen. God damn it, listen to people. Hear what they're saying. Don't superimpose, so what you're saying is, no, don't do that, you don't need to do that. Just listen to what people are saying. Then, ask questions, and listen to what they say in response. Too often we walk into situations with this preconceived idea of what people are going to be like, what they're going to think, how they're going to reason. And one of the reasons that we don't like being asked questions is because we recognize something that Socrates recognized, except he was comfortable admitting it, which is that we don't know anything. We know very little. We know very little. And the only way, that, and, and that makes sense, by the way, because we don't spend a whole heck of a lot of time trying to, trying to get answers to things, trying to figure things out. Because once we figure things out, once we get answers, what does that do? 
it destroys this simplicity. It abolishes this ignorance. And once we're no longer ignorant, life is no longer simple. Once we're aware, you're suffering. Suffering. now we're suffering. Because this is a true story, if you've ever heard this before. Life is suffering. Oh. You don't get to choose not to suffer, but you can choose what it is that you're going to suffer for. We like simplicity and ignorance because it alleviates the sufferings of life. Now, this is why when I tell you guys, don't study philosophy. Don't do it. And people think, oh, it's reverse psychology. I respect you guys way too much to use reverse psychology against you. That's, mani that's manipulative. I don't want to manipulate anybody. That's... It would be a strange thing if I'm a philosopher and I'm looking to manipulate you. Because a philosopher, by definition, is somebody who loves wisdom and wants to know truth. I wouldn't use a lie to get you to find truth. That's contradictory. That would mean I don't really believe the things I'm saying. But the way that you can alleviate some of the suffering of life, there's two ways. One of it, be ignorant of it. Be ignorant of it. You've seen the, I don't know what they call them, severe special ed kids? You know, the ones like in the helmets and stuff, they walk around campus sometimes, they, they take out the community. Yeah. Are, those, are those kids suffering? No. Not the same ways that you and I are. It's different suffering. Not the same way. But for them, right, we think like, oh my gosh, I would never want to be that way. You, with your present mindset, with your present awareness, right. wouldn't want to be that way. But then again, they probably look at you and say, I wouldn't want to be like that either, with their present awareness and their present mindset. Why? Because we don't know what we don't know. They don't know what it is like to be us, and we don't know what it's like to be them. Just like, by the way, you might say, oh, so you're separating into these two categories. Yes. I'm about to do it even more. I don't know what it's like to be any of you, and none of you know what it's like to be me. How can you know what it's like to be me? You can. What's that? By being with me. By being with me. And what would you do when you were with me? Talk. Ask questions. Yeah. Listen to the answers. And then answer my questions. You know, listen, listen to my questions and answer my questions. In other words, having a conversation with people, finding out from people. Communication. And that's how I'm going to discover these things about you. Now here's the thing. Once I communicate with you, I'm now aware of your suffering. And if I care anything about you at all, I'm now involved in your suffering, I'm now sharing in your suffering. And there's something that helps to alleviate it like that as well. Because the second way to alleviate suffering is to find a, a why. To find something that helps to transcend the suffering, it makes the suffering worthwhile. That's what makes it so unbearable. First off, it, it's unbearable because we feel so isolated and alone. We don't know, in other words, I'm the only one who's going through this. Yeah, but you don't have to be. There are people around you who care, who want to share in your suffering. Not everybody does. The people who want to, they're very narrow. Those are, those are your very close friends. Like I've asked before, if any of you had a party, if any of you guys were having a party and you didn't invite me, would it bother me? Nope. Not particularly. Not particularly. Could you have a good time at a party without me there? Let's say I was, one of, let's say I was a close friend of yours. Could you, could you have a, a, a fun party without me being there? Yeah. Because you have lots of close friends. In fact, you'd probably get halfway through the party and be like, oh, dude, Scanlon never showed up. Oh, my God, I wonder what happened to him. And then you'd go back to your party. And I would be understanding of that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't whine that, oh, my God, they had a good time without me. You don't have, you know, that, that wouldn't bother me so much. I understand how people can have good times without me. But if any of you were going through suffering and you didn't involve me in that, I would be very bitterly hurt by that. Because that would suggest that you don't think that anybody cares of course I care. Anybody who's around you who's close, any of your close friends will care. So if one of my close friends had a party and didn't invite me, it wouldn't bother me. If a close friend of mine was going through some deep level of suffering and they didn't involve me, that would, that would wound me bitterly. Because that would suggest that I wasn't as close to them as I thought I was. This is one of those things that hurts people so much about suicide. People take their own lives because people oftentimes say, like, I wish they had called me. I wish they had involved me. I wish they had said something to me. There are a lot of people around you who would wish that that was the case. And you might say, yeah, but nobody cares. Maybe nobody you're talking to right now cares. That doesn't mean that nobody cares. Yeah, but nobody can understand. 
How do you make people understand that? Communication. Communication. Explain it. I don't know how to explain it. Well, if only you had a class in high school whose whole focus was developed, whose whole focus was on teaching you how to explain yourself. If only you had a teacher. I don't know. It's hard to imagine. Let me imagine a teacher who twice a week gave you the opportunity to understand deep ideas that people were having so that you could understand what they were saying and then develop through practice the ability to explain what they were saying and to be understood. It's a lot to ask. Because you know in high school we don't learn anything useful. But just imagine if you would for a minute what that would be like. Yeah. I wanted to say something. Uh, <clears throat> being alone is uh, or not being alone what, what am I trying to say that's okay, that's okay. okay I can do like a quick rundown of what you think um, uh, that the the suicide thing of being hurt and being able to open up to people um, I, I the reason why I really really like this class and why I like to uh, talk a lot in this class is because uh, I've dealt with bipolar my whole life. I've dealt with uh, uh, bipolar depression. I don't control my emotions and how I feel. Um, that is like in turn to me to internalize stuff like I should be dealing with this myself. I should have that. I shouldn't have to go and ask for people for help. And that has made like my elementary to middle school years feel very alone, even though I had people around me, I didn't want to burden them or make them feel like I had to rely on them with, you know, like I, I had to lay myself onto them so that I could, but that's kind of the point of friends, that's kind of the point, the point of having people that are close to you and people that want to talk. I, I like I like talking to people. I don't like taking things seriously. I, I, even if you ask me if I'm having a terrible, awful day, I will not let my emotions affect me. I will always try to be professional and stuff like that. Because in the back of my mind, I don't want to be that person. Even though I might be there to carry somebody else's burden. And I forgot the point of Man, man, this really, this really hits me now. Now I understand. If it, if it pops in your head, let me know. This is, I haven't asked you, You're going to make me cry, dude. Because, I know a couple of you guys know. How do I feel about Christmas? Every day is Christmas. Christmas, man. Does anybody know where that comes from? No. no. It comes from a friend of mine who used to run the learning center here. He's like, he's like a dad to me. We're really close. Really? Yeah. His name was Andy Sanchez. And several years ago, I used to coach baseball with Andy Sanchez. And I remember the last thing Andy ever said to me. The last day of school. And I saw him and he goes, Scanlon. Because I quit coaching. He goes, are you going to coach with me again next year? He and I used to do this the way that only my father and son could. And he goes, are you, you going to coach with me next year? I said, Andy, I'd rather hang myself and coach with you next year. And Andy says, that would be a good enough reason for you to coach with me next year. <laughs> I love that. So Andy killed himself a few hours after that. And he threw himself off of his fifth floor balcony over in your downtown, right across the street from the police station. Every time I drive past, I still think about this. And I would see Andy, and Andy, if you ever ask Sanchez, how's it going, Andy? He'd say, oh, every day's Christmas. Because that meant that every day was a gift to open up and you never know what's going to be inside. But it's exciting, just like Christmas morning is. Um, and he was the kind of guy that, I remember after he died, I was talking to one of the custodians here. And he was telling me this story about how Andy asked him one time what time it was. Because Andy was working on the baseball field. And the custodian said, I don't know, I don't have a watch. And Andy said, you don't have a watch? He's like, no, he's like, so Andy would do And Andy would get excited, he would just go, he couldn't talk, he'd, wait. And he went running inside the clubhouse, down on the baseball field, and he came out, and he gave the custodian his watch. He's like, you have to have a watch. You're a custodian, you have to know what time it is. And so the custodian shows me the watch. It was a Rolex. And it was all scratched up, because of him working as a custodian. The guy's sitting there with like a $10,000 watch on his wrist. Andy's wife was extremely wealthy. They were millionaires many times over. 
Um, you guys ever hear of Herbalife? Yeah, that was her family. What the? What? Yeah. What the and so, and he was that kind of a guy, though. He'd give you the watch off of his wrist. It wasn't that he didn't know the price of it. He knew the price of everything, you know, but he also knew the value of everything. And that's the problem. A lot of people, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. And he just gave him a watch. It's like, oh, but he had lots. So what? He gave, he gave the dude a Rolex. And by the way, the beautiful part of that story is, isn't even so much that Andy gave him a Rolex. It's that the custodian was wearing it every day to work. And it's all scratched up. Just like if you gave him a $10 Casio from Target. He wore it exactly the same way. Because to him, it wasn't the object that was valuable. It was the value of the object that made it valuable. Yeah. So anyway, Andy used to always say, every day is Christmas. So it's my way of keeping Andy alive. Um, if you ever go down to the baseball field, I don't even know where the plaque is anymore. I remember a few years after Andy died, I was upstairs um, during a game. I was talking to somebody up there, and he was doing the announcing for the game, kid Brandon. And there was a plaque for Andy that, was, that, that had been tossed on top of a plastic bin up there somewhere. I think it was supposed to be for the field or something, but they never put it up. And I was just thinking, like, this is glory, isn't it? When you die, we're going to have a ceremony, we're going to have a moment of silence, we're going to make a plaque for you. And then after you're done, after we're done, we're going to toss, this, toss it aside, and who knows what happens to it after that. But um, I hate Christmas. I hate Christmas. Christmas is my least favorite day of the year. I despise Christmas. Christmas growing up for me was full of horrible memories. I remember one year, my um, laying awake at night and hearing my parents in the next room discuss whether we were going to, for Christmas, have a, uh, keep the lights on, keep the, the electricity on, or keep the gas on. We couldn't afford to do both. So we had to figure, they were trying to figure out which one we were going to do. So they decided to keep the lights on that way. They said that way they could have lights on a tree for us like growing up. Um, so now then the question becomes, so why do I hang up Christmas lights in here? Why do I have a Christmas tree? Why do I do all this Christmas stuff? What's that? Okay, so couldn't, when I was a kid? Nope. Because it brings other people happiness? Yeah, because you guys like Christmas. I'm not going to shit on Christmas just because I don't like it. It brings a lot of you guys a lot of joy. You guys like to dress up in heavy sweaters and I like the weather change. You guys like the lights and everything. I'm not going to come in here and show up for Christmas just because I had a bad time with it. doesn't mean you have to have a bad time with it. I want to have a, I want you to have a good time with it. I'm not going to be a burden to you based off of it. And so there's something that's there. We shouldn't be a burden to people with things like that. However, if you're going through something difficult in your life, you're not a burden to the people who love you and care about you. They want to be involved in, it, in all of that. One of the hardest things for some of you to, to comprehend is that. Especially if you have a reputation for being the person who's supposed to be wise, who people go to for advice and, and all of that. You know? I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. So you had your hand up like 10 yeah. minutes ago. Um, no, I was going to say, the the thing thing is, is, when people uh, put themselves in solitude, um, I learned that like, the, the reason people put themselves in that, in that um, state is because sometimes they say to themselves that like, um, well, when someone gives you advice, they either take it, they either take it or they take it as a way as a, of like, no, that's not true. Or, like they don't believe it. Or, like they take it as a way that like, they're getting attacked. That's why they don't want to believe in anything, and that's why they just tend to just do things to cut themselves because they don't want to hear the things that other people say. And they don't want to hear the truth or whatever that other people say. Because then again, like, people can say this and that, but you're going to be, at some point you're going to say, oh, no, but this person did, this person isn't like that. No, it's not like this. Like, like they're always going to be defending themselves instead of trying to take it like someone's trying to tell them. One of the values of solitude is not having to, to deal with that external input. Yeah, there's nothing then. Yeah. Yeah, because when you mention everything feels like Christmas, that actually reminds me actually from a quote from a movie. Um, it, this this part, um this quote says, Yesterday it was like yesterday was history. Tomorrow oh, is a mystery, one. yeah, it's but so today so is a one. gift. That is why it's called a present. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And that's, that actually hits me. I was like, wow, that, that makes sense. And that was from an animated movie, too. That makes it understandable, too. Up until recently, Disney has, uh, I mean, like Disney and Pixar, like yeah. the animated ones, had some really deep messages. Dude, I cried in most of those movies because I get the message, bro.
somebody who was alone and wanted to be alone and always wanted to be alone so that I couldn't hurt anybody. I was somebody who wanted to be around people and make other people happy. So that even if I felt like a burden, I still knew for a fact that one day I gave them coffee or one day that I paid for their food or one day that I was the ear or the shoulder for somebody to cry. I oftentimes feel like that a lot of people don't understand that. And like you were saying how it's it's funny that we feel anger because we care about something. If only I was there. I remember one time I walked home by myself and I was like in like third grade. And it was like we lived three blocks away from the elementary school. My mom got so mad at me because I could have been kidnapped or I, I could have I don't know, died of exposure from walking three blocks. But she was mad because she cared about me. I'm mad at people because I'm because I care about them. I'm mad because I know that there are so many people that you can make an impact on and there's so many people's lives you can make better if you just talk to them. Bro, I'm really gonna cry right now, dude. I have no idea. <clears throat> and I'm sure that there's something about about finding out that you're bipolar, having a third person, third party say it, that's validating as well, because then it's like oh, you listened to me. You heard what I had to say. And it's one of those things about being diagnosed with something like that, that 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 means that the person listened to you. Because if you're, if you're depressed, what advice do we give people? Well, just be happy. <laughs> Are they listening to you if they say that? No. No. If, if, someone's, if you're telling someone like, you know, that these things are going on, it's like, oh, well, you just have to, you just have to, you know, lock it down. You, you have so much to be happy about. How can you don't just be happy? You know, that means that they're not listening to you, you know? I had a, a friend when I was growing up, I um, haven't talked to him in quite a while, but a well, friend of mine, I remember we were having those high school conversations one time, and I was asking him, like, what, like, what do you think, like, if, you, ever, like, you ever wonder about this, like, what if you were to die today, and you had your funeral next week, what would people say about you? That's, I don't know what that means. That's like a way of putting off answering the question. Lots of things. Okay, what would they say about you? Well, it depends. That's a way of not answering the question. That's a way of putting it off. Why don't you just say, let me think about it? <laughs> That's what's really going on there. Or maybe it's overwhelming to think about what people would say about you. I don't know. Like, I think about it, and like depending on, on who it was, what time period of my life they knew me during. Did they know me when I was in high school? Did they know me when I was playing baseball in college? Did they know me when I was doing my PhD? Or did they know me when I was in bands? Or did they know me as a professor? Or did they know me from being here? Or did they know me from being at the gym? In other words, what context did they know me? Because whichever context you know me in, you're probably going to tell very different stories about me. And if you were, and if you were in any of those time periods, there's a very good chance that you might not even know that any of those time periods existed. In other words, if you knew me when I was in a band, and then you were like, and then somebody you know, who trains with me in jiu-jitsu, they'd be like, he was a musician? What, he did jiu-jitsu? That both sides would have no idea that the other version of Scanlon existed. You know? I was asking my, my, my old friend at this point, what do you think people would say about you? And he, and he, was, and he took it as I intended. It was a deep question. And he, and he said, I think that people would say that I was happy. You know, because
because he always came off as happy. And if you, you, if you know what to look for, you notice that, that's, that what you're seeing from people is not generally what... We've got the persona in the shackle. I can use the language. You understand what I mean when I say this. The persona that people are giving off sometimes is that they're happy. And by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, that you're lying about who you are. That means that people are, are lying to themselves about who you are. In other words, um, have any of you seen that movie Sleepers by any chance? Uh, so a very long story short, it's about these kids who go to prison, when, when, when they go to jail when they're little kids, they go to juvenile hall because it's something they did. And while they're there, they're abused by the guards. And when I say they're abused by the guards, you can imagine every form of abuse, that's what the movie depicts. And so um, the movie shows them when they're older, and what the, so they're now adults, and there's this guy, he's sitting there eating dinner with his dad. His dad's like, you know, old school, kind of dad, not emotional. So his dad's like, so how are things, how are things with you? And he's trying to explain to his dad about what happened to him while he was in juvenile hall and how he was abused by these guards. And his dad just cuts him off. So, but, but right now, but right now, how are things with you right now? How's work? And he's like, oh, works, works good, dad. And he's like, eating spaghetti. He's like, okay, so things are good. Good, good. I'm glad things are good. In other words, he's completely ignoring what, what's being said to him. The, kid, the guy's not lying about, about what he's going through. It's just that the world won't listen. And it makes sense, by the way. First off, maybe we don't know what to listen for. Maybe... We don't want to hear it. Maybe we're not capable of hearing it. Who, it doesn't have to be a nefarious thing. It doesn't have to be this, like, arms folded, nobody cares. You know, people are wrapped up in, their, in themselves. And it takes, it takes something, it takes a person who's kind of already okay with themselves to be able to now be okay with, with understanding other people, if this makes sense. So, yeah. Just to bring you back to everything, does that make them evil? Evil? No. We don't know what we don't know. We're evil when we know what we're doing. Little kids are evil for eating a cheeseburger. You can tell me if you think you are. I don't know. So, you know, we can talk about that. But anyway, so this, this friend of mine, he said that he thinks that people would say that he was happy. And it wasn't because he pretended to be. It's just because that's, because who are you? Are you happy or are you sad? Yes. Are you, are you smart or are you stupid? Yes. Depending on the context in which you are. And so the people typically found him when he was in these moments of, 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 of happiness. Um... And so anyway, I was thinking about that, and he asked me what I thought people would say about me at my funeral, and I gave him my answer. So then I asked him, what, do you, what, what would you want people to know about you? And he was thinking about it, and he said, I want them to know I was sad. And it wasn't because he wanted to be a burden to, to people. It's because he wanted to be understood. And that's, that's a deep desire for all of us, to be known and to be accepted and God willing to be understood, that would be you know, the deepest part of understanding, the deepest part of, of connection there. But at the very least to be known, you know, and to be accepted. Huh. Yeah. And that's something that everybody wants, everybody would want to be accepted. And so, you know, you're not a burden. You're not. Um, there are little things like that, like if you're having a bad day, don't push your bad day on everybody else. That's how you make it a burden. If you hate Thanksgiving, don't crap all over Thanksgiving for people who like it. You, know, you can keep those kinds of things to yourself. But if you're going through things, there are those people in your lives who, who do care. You have to find them. You know, and if you think nobody cares, you're wrong. Somebody does. You're not that far away. You know? um, but we didn't even talk about evil. That's fine. Try like 45 minutes then. So we can let evil fall to the side until next semester. This is a great therapy session. <laughs> Especially since we never even touched the quote. We didn't even touch it. It's okay, though. Touch something. We, but that's the thing. Is like, that's what we're looking for when we do these quotes. You might look at it and go, like, I really even talk about the quote. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints? I, I needed this. <laughs> I really need this quote. <laughs>